Our first speaker is online. Um, uh, we're going to focus on practical solutions for service improvement. And um, we're going to be joined first by uh, Professor Claire Mackay, who is a professor of imaging neuroscience at the University of Oxford. She leads the Translational Neuroimaging Group. Um, and she's also been um, really pivotal in setting up uh, research at the heart of the um, memory service in Oxford. So I hope, Claire, you're online and ready to speak to us. Thanks very much for joining when you're not feeling too well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. And I'm so sorry I'm not there um, uh, with you all today. I thought I uh, should keep my gems to myself and not spread them around our community. But I'm very sad not to be there with you all. Um, I am uh, talking to you today a bit about some practical solutions in thinking about how to set up a brain health clinic. Um, and I, I really thoroughly enjoyed all of the sessions today. And there have been so many sort of themes repeating um, themselves over and over. This is a slide I think that Vanessa did show you earlier, um, but it mirrors really closely the slide that um, uh, Chris showed in the very first talk of today, uh, um, sh um, demonstrating what the key drivers are of thinking about setting up brain health infrastructure. So that's earlier and more accurate diagnosis, personalized risk reduction management, um, alignment of services with uh, research in order that we can do precision recruitment, preparation of the infrastructure to support disease modifying therapies and supporting an underserved community, particularly those with early disease. So I think that there seems to be a really strong consensus around those as being the key drivers of why we need to think about adapting services. But of course, we need to be thinking about that in the context of what is a, a really overloaded um, NHS at the moment with chronic underfunding, particularly in our area, and uh, a workforce that's um, uh, that's on its knees in some instances, and of course patchy availability of the diagnostics that we've been hearing about today. So, um, as you've already heard today, there are a number of sort of brain health clinics springing up around the country, and uh, but the models that people are adapt adopting are really quite different, and this is just a kind of cartoon of some of those examples. So in some cases, the, the brain health clinics are tertiary referral clinics, and those um, are more often found in neurology-based services. In some cases, they're secondary referral-based clinics or uh, adapting to work within the memory clinic as it stands. And then there's the ambition in, in some cases to enable self-referral, um, although I don't think any of the NHS services are actually offering that yet with the potential um, uh, that the, 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 the people that are most far ahead with that are Brain Health Scotland, Craig Ritchie and Brain Health Scot Scotland. And then within these various models, there are all sorts of ways of ad adapting, uh, adopting uh, research consenting. So there's, there isn't a one size fits all. There are lots of ways of doing this, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about how we've gone about it in Oxford as an example. And um, again, there are, uh, there are several examples from around the country, as you saw earlier. So again, this looks a lot like um, a slide that you've seen earlier today. This is the cartoon of our um, referral and uh, memory clinic pathway for um, patients who are referred through the psychiatry-based memory clinics in Oxford Health. Um, uh, these are, there's nothing ivory towers about these clinics, although they've got the word Oxford in them. Um, until we came along and incorporated our brain health clinic, th this was a very typical uh, psychiatry-based memory clinic service with um, uh, really no availability of MRI. Um, of patients are referred to uh, a CT, most patients are referred uh, to have a CT scan en route to their memory clinic appointment before they attend the clinic where they have their um, clinical and cognitive assessments and are diagnosed or, or otherwise. So um, we wanted to embed research within this clinic and to serve both the clinical needs and the research needs. And so the way that we did it in Oxford was to divert people away from the CT scan that they would have had and invite them to come along to our brain health clinic, which for us is really an assessment center. So we um, embedded uh, research consent in, in that process. So everybody who comes through the door is asked if they're interested in taking part in research. We think it's important that we're offering them choice. So we offer them, they, they can say no, and that's fine. And we still give them the high quality assessments. And then there's three ways in which they can say yes. They can say yes, you can use the data that you're collecting on me while I'm here. They can say yes, I'm happy to do additional assessments while I'm here. 
and they can say, yes, I'm happy to be recontacted about future studies and trials. And obviously we like it when they say yes to all three of those, but the, um, the, the option for patients to, uh, to choose the level of consenting that they are comfortable with feels important to us and we think gives rise to our very high consent numbers. Uh, the protocol that we put together includes um, cognition, a whole bunch of questionnaires, uh, both for the patient and for the informant uh, and the family member. We do a saliva sample for uh, genetic testing and our, our kind of main research um, specialty, I suppose, is the imaging. So we have um, uh, we've ad adopted the adapted the UK Biobank imaging protocol that we are using both clinically and for research in our population. We interleave the research and uh, NHS can, um, uh, uh, assessments, as you can see here. So the blue bits are the clinical bits, and then the green bits are the research bits. And of course, uh, depending on what consent patients give, they go through more or less of this uh, pipeline. At the end of their visit, however long that might be, a clinical report is generated from all of the data that we've put together and uploaded into the electronic patient record. And where consent has been given, our research database is populated with all of the uh, data that um, uh, they've um, provided. The headline from the clinical report is that because of all of the assessments we're doing um, in the time that would otherwise have been spent doing a CT scan, that means the consultant time uh, has been reduced from 75 to 45 minutes for patients coming through this service. Um, and then for the research data, we um, are high, uh, highly aligned with the Dementias Platform UK and particularly the trial delivery framework, which is led by Vanessa in order to really harness the data that we're collecting alongside all of the uh, equivalent data from around the country and make best use of it. And then for the um, research uh, consent, those patients are channeled into joint dementia research as well as remaining on our registry as well. So um, I, I thought I would just highlight a couple of areas of, um, uh, for today's talk that are not, are not to do with my specific research interests, but uh, the important things that we've been collecting information on as we've been going along. The first is this uh, clinician uh, feedback summary. So this is a bit of qualitative research that was done by a um, Declan Sai student um, when she was with us and led by Jane Fossey in, uh, in Oxford, um, where we uh, survey, we, we asked questions from the clinical staff working in and around the clinic. And importantly, this was for people who are not part of our team. They're not already part of any research infrastructure. These are the people that work full time in the clinical service, seeing patients day in and day out. And when we asked patient, uh, the clinicians their attitudes to the idea of a brain health clinic before we started running it, um, the sorts of comments that we got were um, along the lines of, a lot of our patients don't want to take part in research. I don't think we should be putting patients through what, what more than what we put them through already. We need the patient care to be a central, a post-diagnostic support needs to be integrated, and the concern about creating a two-tier system, all very valid concerns. Um, by the time we were well well into our pilot, the, um, uh, ob the obviously again the headline um, is that the memory clinic appointments are shorter now because of the assessments that we're doing outside of that uh, traditional route. Um, they there it was uh, it's surprise expressed uh, but that patients are so well able to tolerate the additional assessments. The, uh, the clinic staff are finding the, uh, the report that we generate very useful. There's a lot of information in it, um, and it's particularly useful in those borderline cases. Um, and we've worked particularly with our radiology colleagues to generate a more standardized um, radiological report. And that's, that was highlighted as being something that was particularly valuable. So getting away from the, um, uh, uh, the, the common... Um, occurrence that we heard about earlier today, which is the um, radiology report being rather ubiquitous and not very um, fine grained. We have um, consistently very uh, good feedback. I won't go through this slide in any great detail, but I did just want to highlight one of the things that we ask patients as they walk out of the door is, would they have been willing and able to complete more assessments to spend more time at the brain health clinic? Um, uh, and the vast majority of them, 85%, are saying that they would have been able to do more if we had asked them to do more. And a similar percentage are, are saying that they would be happy to, to do more 
after they've left the brain health clinic and gone home. This slide just shows you a, um, a, a, a it's, it's really just to demonstrate that this is a very sort of typical uh, psychiatry based memory clinic uh, population. So the average age is 78. We've had an 101 year old come through our brain health clinic. Uh, um, uh, the uh, the diagnoses that people are given, obviously that that's subsequent to them uh, being in the clinic, but when we um, extract their diagnosis from their clinical records sometime later, about a third have MCI, so about a third are in that still in that very early phase. About half are diagnosed with um, one dementia or another, and then the remaining um, patients are either have no diagnosis or um, there's a, a a few kind of um, uh, mood disorder or anxiety disorder, etc. Things that should, uh, crop up as well. So I hope that looks like a fairly typical um, psychiatry-based memory clinic um, um, spectrum of patients and uh, uh, that we are APOE genotyping them. And again, that's exactly what you would expect. Now, our um, uh, research interest is in particular, as I said, is the UK Biobank. And we've aligned a lot of what we've done in Oxford with the UK Biobank and, Biobank, and particularly the imaging um, protocol is, uh, is directly aligned with the Biobank, both for the standard clinical scans and for the um, uh, research scans. So that means patients only have to tick that first level of consent, the yes, you're, I'm happy for you to use my data, and we've already got uh, UK Biobank uh, compatible imaging data uh, from them. And of course, that opens a, a world of opportunities for the data scientists, as we heard about earlier, having the, um, the, the, the high quality clinical phenotyping in a population that you can sort of directly triangulate with the massive population, which is the UK Biobank, is uh, uh, we, we, we think gives us uh, exciting opportunities for future data science projects. Uh, the person who's leading a lot of this imaging work is Ludovica Grafanti, who's there in the audience with you today. And she's um, uh, been working particularly on, uh, uh, on adapting the UK Biobank automatic analysis pipelines so that they are um, appropriate for the brain health clinic population. And that's her, her kind of um, uh, ongoing work. So um, a, a earlier this year, in June this year, we, well, no, throughout this year, in fact, we've been working with the AIUK policy team with um, Susan and Izzy in particular, thinking about the fact that we think that developing brain health clinics is important for all the reasons that were on my first slide there. Um, but but how can we? Um, uh, what are the what are the things that we need to sort of put together? What evidence do we need to put together to be going to policymakers to 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 be convincing people? How do we convince commissioners? How do we convince uh, NHS England? How do we convince whoever needs to be convinced that better quality assessments and uh, readying the services for disease modifying therapies is is something that we we urgently need to do now? And again, that's been. A strong theme in the room today. Um, so we put we 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 brought together a number of the early adopters of brain health clinics and um, and set out some workshops where we went through some of the key challenges. Um, and I should uh, just uh, um, thank the Oxford Open uh, Oxford Policy um, Engagement Network for the funding for this um, this uh, workshop. Um, this is, I, I won't go through this slide in great detail, but what we really focused on were the barriers and the be beginnings of potential solutions. And we, we don't pretend for a moment that we have all the solutions at, at this point, but I just wanted to highlight this as a effectively an ongoing dialogue. And it would be great to involve as many of you as, as are interested in this dialogue as we take it forward to think about how we, um, how we modularize brain health clinics to make them as easy as possible for people to, um, to uh, ad adopt, how we think about what a brain health clinic in a less ivory towered situation would be. Obviously ours is very um, predicated on, uh, on the availability of scanners. That's, that's clearly not the case in, um, uh, in most of the NHS. So what, what are the elements of brain health clinics that we can enable to, to be widespread um, to, um, to, to make sure that people, as many people as possible are benefiting from this sort of thing. So um, my um, uh, penultimate slide is just to, uh, is just to um, uh, make the point that uh, it, the way that we've set this up, we think is a win-win-win. So the clinic 
has the opportunity to has um, uh, what we're hearing is that the clinic has increased confidence in the diagnoses that they're able to make. We've obviously done this uh, magic trick of, of reducing appointment times by by uh, um, doing a lot of the assessments in uh, in the research side of the equation that would otherwise have been done in the uh, in the consultant time. Um, and as I said, that there is pleasant surprise that patients are well tolerating this um, level of increased uh, assessment. From the research side, we get more than 90%, 80%, 70% consent for the use of data, additional assessments, and recontacted respectively. That gives us a really uh, highly representative data set of our local population in terms of the data science that we're able to do and uh, hopefully gets over some of those issues from the previous talk about the people who are often excluded, particularly from the sort of higher end um, uh, trials, uh, studies and trials. And of course, by working with the Dementors Platform UK trial delivery framework, we should be able to pull together the, um, the platform that enables us to, uh, to accelerate precision recruitment for studies and trials. Our patients are very happy. They're getting, uh, they feel well looked after, they feel well assessed. We've got, um, uh, and of course, there's the potential that they're getting more accurate and early diagnoses as well. And in our context, we're also ticking the box for our um, uh, the, our local healthcare leadership, who are um, who, who are very keen, who who have it as a very clear mission to embed research in into the service and the culture. So that's uh, all from me. Our Brain Health Clinic has been running since August 2020, and we're now just at the point of submitting our first papers. So the protocol and the uh, the, the overall protocol and the uh, imaging protocol are now available on Med Archive and they're in submission. Um, so you can uh, find out all of the details there. And then the third paper that's in submission is the one I told you about with the, um, the cl clinician perspectives on the Brain Health Clinic. Thanks very much. Right, so we're going to move to questions at the end, and the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Jeremy Isaacs. He's a consultant neurologist with lots of strings to his bow, including an interest in functional cognitive disorder. Um, but he's clinical director of the NHS London Dementia Clinic Network, and I think he's going to focus on a network approach to running clinics today. Thank you. Ray, thanks very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. So, 15 minutes to tell you everything there is to know about how to improve quality in dementia care. So before we move into the nitty gritty, let's have a think about what it is that we measure, what it is that we can measure in, in dementia. So I put in blue the things that the NHS routinely measures. So are people getting a diagnosis? We measure that through the Dementia Diagnosis Rate, or DDR, and that is unfortunately a crude and rather flawed measure because among other, reasons, for other, among other things, it's not adjusted for deprivation and ethnicity, which influence dementia prevalence, as Charlie was saying earlier. We also measure um, uh, whether diagnosis and support is timely. NHS England has a six-week ambition so that everyone, uh, as many people as possible, should get a diagnosis and a care plan within six weeks of referral to a memory service, and we, we can measure that. Then there are things that the NHS doesn't measure routinely, but we can measure through auditing. So, for example, is diagnosis accurate, which is something that's come up quite a bit today? Uh, a hard thing to measure, but you can get, I'll show you some ways in which we can think about that. Is there unwarranted variation in practice? We can get that from big audits. Uh, and our service is implementing evidence-based interventions, another thing that we can audit. And then at the bottom are the things that we really have developed almost no measurement infrastructure around, but the things that actually really matter. So are dementia su support services actually supporting people? Are we avoiding preventable crises? And are people living with dementia and their supporters living well? Are we asking people who have this group of conditions the questions about things that really matter to them? And are we working out whether our interventions really make a difference. And I don't think we're doing that at all, unfortunately. So I'm not going to talk about the DDR because I've got enough time, but I'll just talk a little bit first about timely uh, diagnosis. So we have this um, ambition that everyone should get a diagnosis and treatment within six weeks of referral. And in the London region, um, my predecessor set a very uh, high ambition uh, that we would get to 85% of the people in London uh, getting their diagnosis within this time frame. So we have to think if we're going to have an ambition like that, well, what are the ingredients of success? What are the things that affect the speed of diagnosis? So you can have demand and capacity in a memory service, but you say if you haven't got enough staff or too many referrals, obviously that's going to affect things. 
but you can also look at the efficiency of your memory service pathway. And it is possible to streamline pathways. Now, we can measure some of the variation. This is um, the uh, waiting time to diagnosis across all the memory services in London. I'm not going to tell you which is which. I've anonymized it, but this is from June. It kind of goes up and down a little bit like a graphic equalizer. But broadly speaking, you know, people, it's the same services at the bottom and the top uh, over, over time. And what you see on the y-axis there is, is the weeks. And you can see that there are some services that, that can achieve an average waiting time of below five weeks to diagnosis from referral, and some that are up there at about half a year. And if you look at a national level, this is from the, um, the uh, National Audit of um, Dementia Memory Assessment Service Spotlight Audit, which was done last year, you can see here, this is in days now, and this is about uh, 100 different services around the country, and you can see that there's huge variation. And there are some that are really quick and some that are, are much slower. So some of that will be demand and capacity, but some of it will be about internal practices. So we did a piece of work, Laura Cook and I, at the, at the, memory net, uh, the uh, London Dementia Network, did a piece of work about five years ago now, where we visited almost all the memory services in London, and we did these sort of had all our flip charts and we went through their pathway and then we came out with some recommendations about how you can streamline the pathway so it was applying a little little bit of lean methodology to this this process so we looked at things like triage so are you doing daily triage and are you triaging straight into a clinic appointment and what about assessment so is the person who's doing the assessment the initial assessment someone who can actually make a diagnosis because of it and, and our recommendation is that you should front load expertise into the initial appointment because what you sometimes see is the first assessment is done by someone who can't make a diagnosis, they need supervision, and then you have to wait for that supervision to happen, and only then someone might order some tests, and then they come back, and then they get a diagnosis. And we think that if you can make a diagnosis at the first occasion, that's what you should do. And then we made some recommendations about supervision, and sorry, this is I just lifted this from our, from our report. But what we saw a bit of example of was things that were called multidisciplinary team meetings, but really weren't multidisciplinary team meetings. They were one-on-one -on -one supervision in which one person was providing the supervision. They went around, everyone in turn, and supervised them. But that meant that everyone had to sit in the room while that was happening, and that's a very, very poor use of time. So um, try to do supervision on a one-to-one -one basis, and ideally do it in real time, in the clinic. And Enfield at the time had this very nice model that we called the floating consultant, the consultant who would float from room to room. There'd be parallel assessments going on, and they would offer supervision in real time. Um, whoops. Now, um, what about measuring uh, variation in, in memory service? So, so looking at these things that aren't necessarily lifted from the NHS, but we can look at through case note audit. So we've sort of developed this over several years, and I started this in 2015. We did a pilot uh, study looking at eight services and none joined in, and we looked at nearly 300 patients. Then in 2016, we refined the methodology, and we did it with 10 services in London and 590 case notes. And then we ran it nationally in 2019 with 85 services and 4,000 case notes. And then we got it commissioned by HQIP, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists led it, and they've just published their report. Now we've got 6,000 case notes and 138 services. So this gives us a great deal of, sort of really good information and understanding about the way in which services vary in terms of what they do. And as you would, uh, you might not be surprised to know that there is in fact very little consistency in the way in which patients get assessed, in the diagnostic tests that get performed, in the diagnosis that are given, or in access to clearly evidence-based interventions that are in nice guidance. So, so here's a good example of that. So this is um, from our audit in 2019. Our patients, what percentage of patients in the memory service are asked about their hearing? And you can see here that it doesn't matter whether you, you are NSNAP accredited or NSNAP unaccredited, that there's extreme variation from everyone being asked to virtually no one. Now, we have taken this forward in a bit of QI work, so we know that, um, uh, in the interest of time, I won't take you through this slide, but the, the links between hearing loss, hearing impairment, and dementia are, are, are well known. And what we've done, we did a workshop with um, the NHS London Healthcare Science Team, which is where audiology sits within NHS London, and we've come up with some uh, checklists, which we're now going to roll out. This is a checklist for uh, memory service clinicians to pick up hearing impairment in their patients. And this is a checklist for audiologists to pick up memory service, memory impairment in their patients, because, of course, there's a lot of crossover. And this will help make sure that, we, uh, that people don't get missed. There's a lot, probably a lot of people with memory impairment undiagnosed sitting in audiology services and vice versa. What about imaging? So um, uh, this is from the 2021 audit, the most recent one, and this shows you the percentage of patients in each service who got a scan. 
Okay, so, so the yellow is the percentage who didn't get scanned, and the blue, broadly speaking, and the dark is the people who did. And you can see that um, some services scan everyone who comes in, and some services scan no one who comes in. So there's huge variation. And in terms of, we looked in our audit at the modality, and you can see that there's a predominance of CT in the UK, uh, this is actually England, but in English memory service practice, um, and uh, MRI is probably used in about a third of occasions, but it varies significantly, you can see that, between uh, services. So somewhere MRI is pretty much the default model, and somewhere nobody gets an MRI. Does it matter? That's a, a rhetorical question. But we then produced some um, neuroimaging uh, guidance, so with Stephen Williams Foley, who's a consultant psychiatrist in West London, who uh, runs a memory service, we went, he and I and Laura, looked at the nice guidance and actually tried to operationalize it a little bit better. You know, who should really have a CT? Who's okay with an MRI? Now, obviously, this will need to be updated as evidence change when we think about treatments. But uh, there is advice out there to try and rationalize this, this, this practice. And then we also, in our 2017 Memory Pathway report, looked at procurement. So procurement of imaging is, a, is, I think, a bit of an issue that we don't think enough about. <coughs> memory services are run by mental health trusts. There is probably only one mental health trust in the country that I'm aware of that has its own scanner. Every other service has to procure imaging from another provider, usually an acute trust next door or sometimes the independent sector. And, and there's ve most memory services have got very little sight of the contract. And actually, there are, you know, if, you, if you dig out the contract or renegotiate it, then you can start to put in some quality indicators. So, you know, how long are we going to wait for the report? Can we get MRI as well as CT? Who's going to report the scan? Um, what sequences are we going to get? And importantly, can we look at the images? Can we access the PAC system? And can we meet regularly with radiologists and other specialists to discuss the findings? I mean, in neurology practice, it would be anathema for us to be not to be able to sit down regularly with neuroradiologists and look at scans and discuss findings. So we did a, uh, an evaluation of exactly this in a memory service context. So this is a joint uh, memory service neuroradiology and neurology NDT that runs in southwest London. Uh, and we sat in on those meetings. Uh, we sort of ran it a little bit more frequently, put some funding in to do that. And then we saw what happened. And it covers a population of about a million. And what you can see is that you discuss up to 16 patients over 90 minutes. You can't go on for more than 90 minutes because a radiologist starts to get fatigued. Um, there was over-representation of patients aged under 65, so they were 20% of the cohort, and you wouldn't expect them to be quite so much in, a, in, a, in a, just a routine, uh, unselected group. And there was an over-representation of frontotemporal dementia at 12%, and that's quite remarkable when I show you how infrequently FTD is diagnosed in memory services in a moment. And in over 50% of the cases that were discussed, an uncertain diagnosis was finalized or previous diagnosis was changed. There was clear impact on the diagnosis. And what wasn't happening was that patients were just being lifted by me and the other cognitive neurologists sitting there. We were not lifting the patients saying, come and see us. Actually, the rate of onward referral to us was low. So people were staying within the memory service, which is for continuity's sake, probably what we want. And again, the recommendations for further tests, such as biomarkers, were also low. So this doesn't lead, at least in our hands, to kind of people just being sucked into over-investigation. Actually, it's, it's a mechanism of achieving clinical pragmatism. The meeting now runs bi-monthly. It's on Teams, so the pandemic has taught us that we can run meetings like this on Teams. And we went around London and ensured that all memory services have access to this kind of radiology MDT on a regular basis. And I think when we think about going forward, sort of models that we might need to roll out treatments in the future, this kind of discussion, these kinds of pathways are going to be essential. Um, we've done a little bit of work looking at variation in access to neuropsychology, which varies a lot um, from, trust, from memory clinic to memory clinic. We've done some guidance around that. Um, and then let's uh, have a, just a quick think about dementia diagnosis. So do you get a dementia diagnosis when you go into your memory service? So this is in the most recent, uh, recent audit. And what you see here is that there are some services where if you walk through the door, you are going to get diagnosed with dementia. You're not going to get out without a diagnosis. And there are some where you're going to be really quite lucky to get a dementia diagnosis. And so there's clear, clear variation. What is, the, what, what is that all about? Um, and there's also a lot of variation in the way in which MCI gets diagnosed. So this is from our uh, 2019 audit, and the, 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 um, the red bits of the bar are the MCI, the, use of the, the, the prevalence of uh, the incidence of MCI in that cohort, or the, the frequency with, it, with, with which that is used. And so you look, and what we see there in the top line is that although only th although the, the overall rate of MCI diagnosis is 17% across the whole cohort, it varies from one memory service to another from 0 to 47%. 
And that variation has to be unwarranted. Okay, that, they cannot be that variation in the real population. So this is something to do with, the, the, with pra memory service practice. And if we look at the subtype diagnosis, so this is just uh, so this is looking just at the over 65s in our in our audit. And um, what we've put down here is the uh, expected prevalence. We stole that from um, I think that was Dementia uh, UK, the second edition, which had some sort of consensus estimates of the prevalence of the different subtypes. I'm sure that 10% from its dementia is wrong, but this was a few years ago. Um, and um, we looked here, you can see the service variation. So some services, 7% of people get Alzheimer's, some 82%. Okay, so that's clearly unwarranted variation. Vasta dementia, 0 to 43%. Mixed dementia, 0 to 80%. It's kind of all over the shop. Unspecified dementia, diagnosis that we should all be, always be trying to avoid. Up to, in some services, 50% of people got a label of unspecified dementia. And that's almost certainly poor practice. But then look down here. Only 0.3% of people aged 65 and over coming through memory services got a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. That was 11 out of, maybe some of those were under 65, it was about 10 out of you know, 3,500 patients. So this is, this is almost certainly being significantly under-recognized in memory service, and I think that is quite problematic. Um, final thing about evidence-based uh, guidelines, so antipsychotic prescribing. So this is a huge success story in the UK, and I think Shubhi Banerjee and others who led on this deserve you know, uh, the Nobel Prize or the equivalent in dementia for doing this. This, this shows you the rate of prescription of antipsychotics in the period from 2005 to 2015 in people with a dementia diagnosis. And what you can see is that over a period of about eight years, there's a very significant decline in the use of antipsychotic medication. Down there to about, by the time we got to 2015, it was about 14%. If we roll on to now, what you can see here in the England, the all England figure is here. By the time we get to the pre-pandemic level in 2020, it's come down further. It's just hovering just below 10%. So there's further success at doing this. Now you can see with the pandemic, there was a bit of a blip. And since then, although it went down, it's been rising again. Now, the, the, the absolute increase is not that high. It's about one to two people per hundred who are now on antipsychotics who weren't previously. But it is something we've got to keep a constant eye on because these drugs, although they have a role, are risky for people with dementia. And uh, we've done a bit of guidance on, on this, which came out a couple of days ago, so do look that up. Um, um, I'll skip over these things, and I just want to make one final point. So this is the well pathway for dementia, which has informed the way that NHS England thinks about dementia. And a huge amount of the measurement of what, what we think about is, is on here, diagnosing well, and a little bit about supporting well. But we really have not opened the lid properly on our people living well, uh, let alone dying well with dementia. So there's stuff that we're really not, not measuring. And so I, I said to my team at the network, can we start to look at emergency admissions of people who have a dementia diagnosis in London? So this is just the first cut of the data looking at the last three years. And you, know, you can see that it was very high for some reason in 1920. This, this, was, only, this was probably just the beginning of the pandemic. And it, um, but, but since then, it's sort of been a bit stable. But we're still to dig deeper into this. And this is length of stay for people with dementia, uh, coded dementia in, in an acute hospital across the different London ICBs. So, so we do have some of this data, but we're really in the infancy of using it in a creative way. So in summary, I think we can improve the quality of dementia care. I think we focus measurement and quality improvement activities on diagnosis and early intervention. Downstream out outcomes are harder to measure and harder to change, I think, but I think they're actually more important. We need to know, are people with dementia living well? We need the NHS to find a way of lifting that data so that we can work out whether the support services that we commission are actually doing the job that we're paying them to do. Are we avoiding crises like unplanned admissions? And data are very limited. And I th I'm going to finish with a provocation to this audience in particular. I think we need biographical markers more than we need biomarkers. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. And our next speaker is... Dr. Tunesi Ivenzo, who's a consultant old age psychiatrist uh, based in Newport. And Tunesi has managed to integrate some high tech imaging into her memory service. Uh, so we'd really like to hear about that. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, so, um, in the next couple of slides, um, I'd like to talk um, about overcoming barriers to early dementia diagnosis. Um, I'll start with some background information and then I'll discuss how a group of colleagues and I have tried to overcome some barriers and I'll end with a patient's story. Um, by way of um, background, we know that lots of factors can affect a person's ability to obtain an early accurate diagnosis of dementia. P 
people's experiences and culture can also play a part in how aware people are when changes begin to occur with their memory. This in turn may affect how early they present seeking diagnosis. In addition, some attitudes and experiences of healthcare practitioners also affect the ability of a person to obtain an early and accurate diagnosis. Also, the facilities available to healthcare practitioners can affect um, the ability of a person to receive an early accurate diagnosis. Um, Findings from respondents in a report produced by the Royal College of Psychiatrists and Alzheimer's Research UK, I think it was 2021, included the fact that 6% of old age psychiatric services in the UK were able to fully meet the NICE guidelines regarding accessing further biomarkers and diagnostic tests for Alzheimer's disease. So in um, Newport, where I work, we tried to change the facilities available to us in order to obtain earlier accurate diagnosis of dementia for our patients. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'll just give you some background about um, the health ward I work in. Um, so um, Newport Memory Clinic is one of five memory clinics within the Aniram Bevan University Health Ward um, area. Um, and um, Within the memory clinics, in the last financial year, within our health ward, um, we had about 3,000 um, memory clinic referrals, 900 of which came from um, Newport alone. So over the last few years, we've really gotten good at diagnosing uh, mild, moderate, severe, and um, dementia. We also follow up our patients and we support them. But what we found was that there were people who would come to our clinic with um, mild memory problems and then they would have um, a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and then they would have to be um, discharged back to their GP because of a lack of resource. And then what we then saw was that they would come back to our clinic um, soon after. Um, and a group of us wanted to address this um, challenge. So. To address the challenge of mild cognitive impairment, we had to um, pay attention to some guidelines and some policies. We looked at um, the guidelines from the Royal College of Physicians and Royal College of Radiologists on evidence-based in indications for the use of PET-CT in the UK. We also looked at the guideline for dementia, um, which was published in 2018. The other guideline was published in 2016. So quite a long time ago, because we work in Wales, we were influenced by um, the Dementia Action Plan for Wales, which was um, published in 2018 by the Welsh Government. So all these things facilitated our action. So what did we do? Working in partnership with the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Wales, our PET scanning um, department in Cardiff University um, Health Ward, and our radiology um, directorate colleagues. Through a pilot project, we defined a functional neuroimaging pathway to aid diagnosis of dementia in the health ward. The success of this pilot led to FDG PET scanning for dementia being commissioned and funded nationally by the Welsh Health Specialised Services Committee. We then leveraged the success of these um, that pilot, and we proposed the development of a pathway to use um, CSF dementia biomarkers to aid diagnosis of dementia in ADHD. And that's how we roped in our neurology colleagues. So we've improved our facilities by developing three new pathways. We have access to FDG PET scanning, amyloid PET scanning, and CFF, CSF dementia biomarker analysis. And this all led to us um, setting up our Newport Mild Cognitive Impairment Clinic. So the clinic sits alongside our existing memory assessment service. And the aim of the clinic is to accurately diagnose memory problems at the earliest possible stage. Our most common referral source is from primary care, but we do get referrals from neurology. So in terms of what we do in the clinic, we take a comprehensive history, do an examination, psychology, um, if it's indicated, and further investigations. So I'll tell you a bit about how the clinic runs. 
we have criteria for selecting our patients. We select patients of any age who have a memory concern, patients who have a high cognitive score, an ACE3 score of 83 out of 100 is our cutoff, but that's for patients who already have um, this um, score available to them. And we also look at patients who have a good functional ability. In terms of st structure, our clinic is run jointly. Um, currently, I run the clinic with um, a neurology colleague of mine, um, and we um, have 75 minute patient slots. We take a comprehensive history. The clinic just want, runs once a month, um, and we started the clinic in September of 2021. So in terms of the history taking, what we look out for is we try to um, establish if patients have um, metabolic or cardiovascular risk factors, which might be affecting their cognitive um, function. We also try to check for polypharmacy and anticholinergic burden. When we discover any of this, we refer to the GP to try and um, sort out the problem. We also do a mental state examination, a fo focused neurological examination. We discuss with the patient their cognitive score and CT scan results. And um, sometimes we're able to give a diagnosis at that point. But if we're not, then we um, ask for further investigations, um, which would include neuropsychology testing, imaging, and CSF biomarkers. So when a patient receives a definitive diagnosis in this clinic, we um, are able to offer through our um, nurse specialist um, who works with us lifestyle interventions, mental health input if necessary. And we find that that's necessary in a lot of the cases and a follow-up plan is um, developed. Um, patients are given information as required and they can be referred to join dementia research. So I'll just tell you a bit about what we've done since September. So as I said, we've um, started the clinic in September 2021. We've seen 40 patients. Um, we have one clinic every month because that's the time we have to give to this project. The age range of the patients has been between 41 years and 85 years. Um, 14 of the patients were less than 65. Um, all patients who've come through the clinic have received lifestyle advice. Um, and um, I think it was 29 out of the 40 have had referrals to neuropsychology. In terms of PET scanning, we've had 27 FDG PET scans undertaken and five amyloid PET scans. So we select the patients depending on what we think is needed. Um, CSF dementia biomarkers, it took us seven months to set up the pathway. And it was nothing really to do with the funding. It was more to do with finding a location and doing all those things that cause barriers in the NHS. So we've done seven lumbar punctures. And um, it was interesting to hear this morning when um, the lady who spoke said how she would prefer to do um, a lumbar puncture rather than um, cognitive testing. It reminded me of a, a patient I'd seen in clinic and um, He'd um, actually, when we explained to him what um, each of these tests could achieve, he said, give me a lumbar puncture because I'll know sooner what's wrong with me. So um, we also refer people for occupational therapy um, input because they have um, ideas about memory strategies. So it's a small number. We haven't diagnosed, um, we haven't diagnosed eight people. We have diagnosed 32. Of those 32, there are 15 people we were able to characterize properly to say that they had early Alzheimer's disease and early mixed vascular and Alzheimer's dementia. Within those seven who had early Alzheimer's disease, to my su surprise, we were able to even go as far as to diagnose them accurately as having posterior cortical atrophy. Um, I, was, um, ex I was speaking to one of my colleagues earlier on to say that we've had patients who have come um, with corticobasal syndrome. And because of the access we have to these um, diagnostic um, facilities, we're able to even try and ca categorize whether this is due to tau pathology or amyloid pathology. So it's very exciting to be able to drill down in this way with our patients um, at the moment. So I will end with a patient story. So this 
59-year-old man was referred to our, patient, um, to our memory assessment service in 2019. He was age 56 at the time. He presented with, a several, with several months of history of forgetfulness affecting his ability to learn new information within his job role in a new job. At the time, he reported he would often start driving somewhere and forget where he was meant to be driving to. He had a history of head injury about two years before following a fall on holiday. He had no word finding difficulties and no decline in his activities of daily living. And there was no family history of um, dementia. So his ACE 3 um, score when he presented was 89 out of 100. He then had a CT scan, which you can see at the top there. Um, it was reported in November as normal normal unenhanced appearances. My colleague who saw him felt at the time the patient had a mild cognitive impairment caused by stress related to his new job and discharged him back to the GP, asking the GP to re-refer in future if required. A year later, the patient was re-referred to our memory assessment service. He changed jobs and he was driving cars, delivering these to people, but has to follow another driver as he struggled to um, remember routes himself. His wife then reported that he forgot information he was told, often misplaced items, and left the fridge door open. So he had begun also to get lost in familiar surroundings. In his son's house, he could not remember where the front door was, and his own home, he had gone into the wrong room, trying to leave the house. He'd continued to forget where he was driving to um, momentarily, even on fam familiar routes, but the routes soon came to him. So he remained independent in all aspects of daily living, but he found um, concentrating when he was trying to organize himself quite overwhelming. And he said that he had to focus on things a lot to get them done. His ACE 3 score was repeated and he scored 81 out of 100, which was an eight point drop in um, <coughs> one year. He had another CT scan. This was in February, 2022. And um, that's the scan at the bottom. So um, that scan was reported as normal. So we asked for an FDG PET scan. And um, there was a non-contrast -con um, CT component of the FDG PET scan. And the comment from the radiologist was that, and that PET scan was done in May. It revealed that the patient had par parietal lobe atrophy. And actually the scan done in February had shown that parietal lobe atrophy. So this is the PET scan. So it shows here that there's um, reduced uptake in the right parietal lobe. There's no pointer, so I can't point, but on the right, it's reduced, um, the hypermetabolism <coughs> is there, and there's um, reduced uptake as well in the left, but mildly more mild than on the right. There's other views of the PET scan. It did show as well that there was posterior temporal lobe, um, oh, there was posterior lobe, posterior temporal lobe um, atrophy, atrophy, hypermetabolism, and the precuneus and the posterior cingulate gyrus um, was also um, showing hypermetabolism. The findings were supportive of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. CSF biomarkers, he had um, a high total tau and he had a low beta amyloid um, 42-40 ratio. We heard about that in the earlier one. Again, suggestive of Alzheimer's disease. Neuropsychology results, he had significant executive functioning difficulties, working memory and processing speed difficulties. He didn't come for follow-up appointments um, easily. Maybe he forgot. Anyway, he, he was contacted by the psychologist who then asked him to stop driving because she was concerned about some of his um, test results. And he was advised to go to the Roku Drive-In Center. So we saw um, SF in September. We've given him a diagnosis of a mild cognitive impairment due to early Alzheimer's disease. We've asked him to stop driving until he, go he goes to the Rookwood Drive-In Center. And we've um, sent him um, you know, um, information about how to get support through the Alzheimer's Society and um, other things like power of attorney. And he's agreed to join dementia research and he's had lifestyle advice. So next steps for our clinic, we'd like to increase our clinic size. We're hoping to cover the whole health board. 
um, evaluate patient and clinician experience, look for more funding, join more research, and add further investigations to what we um, can give patients. So I'll end today by saying um, I'd like to invite you to think what you might do today to improve early and accurate diagnosis in your service. And um, this is um, for me to acknowledge my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Chinezi, and to all our speakers. Have we got Claire back online? I'm not sure. Um, so uh, we've got a few minutes for questions, and I'm going to scroll through them in order of popularity. <laughs> so um, if, you, if you want a question asked, just go and like it. Um, so... Um, so David Llewellyn asks, um, given the extreme clinical variability, and this is to Jeremy, um, seen across memory clinics, will better guidelines be enough or do we need a more fundamental strategic change to ensure evidence-based medicine? Thank you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think the... Um, I, I, uh, I don't know what the answer is, because uh, I think the causes of variation are, are quite complex. Um, but what I do know is that one of the ways to, to, to start the conversation is, is, is to name it and talk about it and then try to create communities of practice. And in fact, the subtitle for my lecture, although I didn't, my talk, although I didn't <laughs> really address it, is creating communities of practice. So what we do in London is every quarter we have a memory services network meeting, um, um, representatives from all the memory services, or most of them attend. We get up to 90 people attending. Um, and we, it's, we put on talks about rare dementias, about um, diagnostic modalities, about quality improvement, which is the main thing that the network does. So I think if we can get people together and talking about some of the variation, getting people through audit to reflect if they're at the far end of one of those graphs of variation, then I think that's a, probably the sort of thing uh, that's going to help. And I also think that, you know, uh, one of the things that I perceived when I first got involved in the memory network, sorry, in the London Dementia Network, and going back to like nearly eight years now, is I, I felt that memory services were often quite isolated and often working without much reference to, not, without much horizontal or vertical integration. So not really necessarily communicating with their next door service in, other, in another trust or board, and not very well integrated with, say, neurology or radiology that, that might be sort of elsewhere, in the, in the, in the, if you like, in the vertical system. So I think that <coughs> the integration and conversations, CPT, the services, and reflecting on variation, if you're at the far end of, 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 a, of a graph like that, is the way forward. Thank you very much. Okay, so a, a popular question from Susan Mitchell is, um, a common thread across all the talks are the benefits of clinical specialties working together. Given the current NHS challenges, how we, can we support clinicians from all backgrounds to work together even more? Um, I don't know who wants to start on that one. Uh, I'm happy to start. I just want to say in Wales, we're very lucky. We don't have this business of mental health and um, physical health being in separate health wards. We're all together. And um, what I found with the work we've done is that we've been able to become more friendly with the other colleagues. And they're really willing to um, work with us. So I, I suppose just starting um, conversations in that way and reaching out to colleagues in other places, they might be able to help. Uh, yeah, and yes, I think that's a really good idea. Anything else anyone would like to add? If I could add, um, uh, Liz, that actually I, I would add the same point. So in our, in our situation, talking to our colleagues in radiology, of course, they're, they're super busy. But actually, it wasn't so difficult to interest them in what we were doing because they, they could see it as a potential long-term benefit for themselves. So um, uh, individual, uh, individual conversations with, uh, with people and understanding their pain and then working with that as well, I think, uh, is the way to go. Yeah, that, I agree. And did you want to add anything? Yeah, so I think, I mean, this is based, again, on, on sort of the, the actual um, the project that I showed where we evaluated what happens in the multidisciplinary meeting. So I think, uh, uh, at the end of the day, of course, we're very, very busy. But most of us could probably schedule an hour in our diary a month from now for a meeting. And if you think about that, if you want, you think about the key stakeholders you want, you try and get them there, you agree a time, everyone brings their most complex cases to discuss. Ideally, if it's, you know, radiology, then you, you know, you have a radiologist and they've got the pack, everything on the, that one pack system. And then the, the conversation will flow from there. 
So I think, uh, you know, to, to get some, some key expertise in a room for one hour with a month's notice and then repeat it once a quarter, even in a very, very stressed NHS, I think that's doable. And you get lots of gains from it. Just one thing, John Paul and I were talking, I don't know where John Paul is now, but, oh yeah, there. we're talking, what, how about a, a core training module for dementia regardless of specialty? Mm. Could we do that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll just say that and then we'll move on. Uh, so, in, um, have we got time for questions? Yeah, the, so, um, so a question for Chinezi. It's fantastic you've got a joint, um, is that the one I've just, well, this, this sort of relates to the last one. You know, what would you like? Okay, okay, good, it doesn't. So you've got a joint neurology, psychiatry, memory clinic model. Um, what other benefits have you seen in this type of service model? And if you had unlimited resource, what would you invest in? Wow. <laughs> so um, the benefit is that um, I've um, learned some skills from my neurology colleague. I suppose just sitting in the clinic and seeing how he does it and how, when he sits and sees how I do it. So we both have grown. And our plan really is that as we go forward, we'll start sitting in separate clinics. So we'll double what we can um, put out, but then um, carrying the skills to the patient as one person. Um, if I had unlimited resources, well, I would like to, <laughs> I would like to add blood biomarkers because I think that's the way um, forward. I would like to add genetic testing as well. And um, I think, um, Jeremy, I think you um, mentioned about um, what is it about how we follow up patients and how um, we measure whether we're doing a good job of it as well. I'd like to see the post-diagnostic support, um, you know, made better. Yeah, so, so okay. And, if, and so the other two, if you had unlimited resources, what, what would you throw into, uh, Claire, what, what would you? Uh, well, for, uh, actually, this also answers another of the questions, which is about fluid biomarkers. So we have um, put, all our, uh, put our eggs into the imaging basket at the moment. We're quite well off for imaging where we are, but we um, uh, the, being able to do fluid biomarkers is still a real challenge for us in our environment. So um, uh, that doesn't feel like a very good answer to unlimited money. I'm sure I could come up with something more <laughs> ambitious than that. But my first priority is about getting fluid biomarkers uh, as part of our model. Okay, and so that explains, it's just technically, for the read, there's a question about saliva versus blood, yeah. is, and it's a, yeah. a sort of logistical issue, is it? Yeah. 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 Okay, and anything to add? Do you really want me to answer that question? Go on. I'm, I'm going to give you a very direct answer. We have a massive recruitment crisis in the NHS, and what we, you cannot offer good dementia care without people and well-motivated, well-supported staff. We need to end the pay erosion of NHS staff, pay us what we deserve for doing the job, sort out the pensions mess that we have as doctors, and then we'll be able to offer really good care to patients. Okay, great. I almost finished. We've got one more minute, so I don't know how we're going to top that. So, um, <laughs> right. Oh, oh so with a question about hearing loss. So, um, so, <laughs> so, um, to ask about hearing loss, having another questionnaire is, is great, but... Um, each time you add this to an electronic health record, there's someone else has to type it in. So um, how can we how can we get over? I mean, it might be the same answer to what you've just said actually, but how, how can we get over the fact that this this all takes time? Yeah. Well, look. I mean, I, I one of the things that is that I that surprises me going from how I do medicine in clinic with patients to how it often works in mental health led services is the amount of box ticking that seems to happen mm. when you're sitting in a mental health trust or, or provider. And there seems to be a huge amount of sort of risk assessment in people who've got, you know, very, very mild cognitive symptoms. So I think it might be a case that we could perhaps remove some of the assessments, some of the boxes we have to tick and maybe replace them with others. Yeah, I, th I agree with that. <laughs> I think we'll draw to a close now. So thanks so much to our three speakers. And, and